while we're waiting. While we're waiting to start, I'm going to encourage everybody on to sign into Poll Everywhere at the login that is listed on this slide. Give you more time to type. We'll give it a couple more minutes. Go ahead and sign on to that Pull Everywhere site. All right, I think uh, we should get started. Welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds today, November the 8th. Please be sure that everybody has the opportunity to vote today. Uh, and uh, and uh, that may be the most important thing you do today. The second most important is joining Grand Rounds today. So, uh, so I am thrilled to uh, have um, our chief residents uh, uh, take over this Grand Rounds and to they have organized a clinical pathologic conference and I, that is gonna be led by the residents. And so I'm gonna turn it over to John Huang, who's the chief resident at Midtown. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Armstrong for the introduction. Uh, welcome everyone to the fall resident CPC. We have a great case plan for you guys and we have a wonderful lineup of discussants. Um, moving forward, I'll be introducing each discussant before their portion of the conference. Um, and please make sure to log into the link below for the poll everywhere. We'll be using it throughout the throughout the case uh, to kind of get some audience participation as well. Unfortunately, we don't have a textable link, so you have to log in through this link below. Briefly, here are the learning objectives, um, and I'm excited to turn it over to our first uh, our resident presenter, Dr. Caitlin Blanchard. She's a current Emory PGY1 transitional year resident who will be going into dermatology. Um, she completed her medical school at Mercer University School of Medicine, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Caitlin. Awesome. Thanks, John. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. Hopefully that looks good for everyone. Um, thanks again, John. Super excited to be here. Like this is yeah, going to be a great case. Really excited. Lots to discuss today. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so this is a 40 year old female who came into Emory Midtown with chief complaint of abdominal pain. Um, a little bit more about this abdominal pain. So really had only been there for about three days or so. Um, seemed to be localized mainly to her upper quadrants, but was pretty diffuse. Um, said her pain was really severe, seven to 10 out of 10 pain. Um, no inciting events or really th anything kind of like triggered the pain. Um, pain only continued to worsen. Um, throughout this like time period, she tried over-the-counter pain medications, even like topical medications, nothing really seemed to help with the pain at all. Um, associated symptoms include nausea, vomiting. Um, she had had some poor PO intake as well for the last week or so, diarrhea for just the past couple of days, um, and abdominal fullness. Um, she said that her belly was twice the size that it um, previously was since um, this illness began. Um, 
few other things that kind of contribute to her picture. So just some subjective fevers, chills, night sweats, um, as well as just like fatigue and overall weakness. Um, she had noticed about a 15 pound unintentional weight loss since this um, kind of illness began. Um, and then she had a 250 pound intentional weight loss over the past three years. Um, so moving into her past medical history and past surgical history, um, like I said, she really was um, a previously healthy 40-year-old female. Um, really only pertinent past medical history was high blood pressure. Um, and then in terms of her surgical history, has um, had a history of an appendectomy, a cholecystectomy. Um, and then she also had a history of childhood seizures, secondary to benign brain lesions um, that she had a VP shunt placed, but that shunt was removed over 20 years ago and um, has had no um, complications since that time. Um, medications, again, really, really short medication list for her. She's just on Lusartan for her high blood pressure. Um, so a little bit about um, her social history. So um, in terms of her smoking use, she does have a 10 pack year history of smoking. It said that she quit two to three years ago um, and then switched to vape vaping instead, um, but had stopped all vaping, all smoking um, for the past six months or so. Um, she does note some occasional alcohol use, um, mostly social, um, occasional marijuana use, although she denies any um, recent marijuana use, um, has had no other like IV illicit drug use or anything like that. Um, she spent most of her life in Houston, Texas, where she grew up. Um, she actually lived there until um, about two weeks prior to her um, presenting to Emory Midtown. Um, did live close to an oil refinery, lived at home with her mom and her pet dog. Um, otherwise, that, that's really it in terms of that. Um, other recent travel, travel history that she had, um, she traveled to Illinois um, where she got engaged and then also um, to Georgia where she has recently moved um, with her fiance. Um, she only has one sexually active partner um, with her fiance, monogamous relationship, no STI history. Um, and then she does report um, a history of eating food from roadside stands and having homemade cheese and queso fresco, which um, seems to be a favorite of um, Texans. Um, otherwise, um, a little bit more about her social history. So no um, uh, reported history of like spending any time in like bodies of water. So no lakes or oceans. Um, and she denies um, walking outside barefoot or anything like that. Um, so she presented um, with her vitals were relatively stable other than her being febrile. Um, T max on her initial presentation was 39. Um, blood pressure, like I said, was relatively stable, 135 over 70, um, and she was breathing comfortably on room air. Um, in terms of her physical exam, she was generally well-appearing, non-toxic looking, um, obese female, no scleral icterus noted. Um, in terms of her cardiovascular exam, she had regular rate and rhythm. Um, lungs were clear to auscultation bilaterally. She was breathing, um, having normal work of breathing on room air. Um, her abdominal exam was definitely the most pertinent in terms of her presentation. Um, so actually had like pretty um, diffuse tenderness to palpation that was definitely worse in the upper quadrants, right and left bilaterally. Had some mild guarding um, and some abdominal distension definitely, but no peritoneal signs or anything else. Um, her neurological exam was intact. She was alert and oriented, no focal deficits were appreciated. Um, and her dermatological exam was without any um, obvious rashes or lesions or, or anything like that. Um, so these were her initial labs when she presented to us. Um, I'm not going to read over all of them, just kind of wanted you to get a good picture of what um, she came in with, but I will highlight some of the um, important things. Um, a little bit hypokalemic, a little bit hypochloremic, um, and then most pertinent thing was her white blood cells. She had some leukocytosis um, elevated to 21 on admission. Um, and so now we'll get into the imaging. So she had this CT done um, in the emergency department in Midtown right when she presented um, and just found um, to have these 
um, lesions all scattered all throughout her um, liver and her spleen. So I'm just gonna, I have a few more pictures of the imaging that she had in terms of her CT. Um, pretty, pretty remarkable, but it just kind of let us appreciate the, the value of that for a second here. Um, and then moving on, just getting the size of some of the splenic abscesses here. Um, that was one of the larger ones. Um, and then here is her MRI as well. Um, the report mentioned that she had over 50 um, liver lesions. So, and then some rather large splenic lesions, as you can see in the imaging here. And then just a few more um, images of that. Um, and so these are some skin lesions that she developed pretty late into her stay. Actually, the first lesion didn't um, start to develop until about day 15 or so. Um, first one was on her right lower leg. She said that she thought it was like an ingrown hair, definitely was painful, um, erythematous, edematous. Um, and then so started on her lower extremity, she developed a few, and then I'll kind of move forward. Um, throughout like the days 15 to 23, the lesions just kind of kept appearing um, and started moving up her extremities. So on the right there, you can see one that was on her upper arm um, and then eventually made its way to her hands. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so that John can go ahead and share his. All right, thank you so much for that introduction, Caitlin. Um, and so now we open it up to the audience. We have the poll everywhere. Uh, the link is noted above. Um, and we wanna give just a minute for all of the audience to participate and put in their most likely diagnosis. You actually also have the option to kind of upvote uh, certain certain options. So if you agree with uh, one, of the, one of the diagnoses that someone else has placed, you can upvote that and we can kind of get a sense of what the audience agrees in terms of most likely diagnosis. And we'll keep this up for just another minute before we transition it over to Dr. Jen Spicer, our ID expert consultants. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you to the audience for participating. And so it seems like overwhelmingly a lot of people are saying some of the endemic fungi. Um, and we'll bring in this poll again uh, later this discussion. Oh, whoops. Sorry. I don't know why that exited out. All right. Um, and so now uh, we'll transition it over to Dr. Jen Spicer, um, our ID consultant, who has actually been blinded to the final diagnosis. Uh, Dr. Jen Spicer is an assistant professor here in the Division of Infectious Disease after completing her internal medicine and ID training here at Emory. Um, she holds many multiple medical education leadership roles on, in UME, as well as within the residency itself. So we're very excited to, to introduce Dr. Spicer. Thank you so much for having me. And um... So what I'm going to talk about today is the approach to fever of unknown origin, which I think is something that we um, get consulted for a lot um, and taking into account some of the specific factors in this case. So um, I didn't have all of the information that was previously shared, but some of it to start the case. And when I um, initially received the information about the case, here were kind of the key portions that I pulled out. I find one of the helpful things whenever you're approaching a patient and it's not clear what's going on is creating a really good problem representation where you take into account pertinent findings that you think will help with specificity in the diagnosis. So some important things here, um, this is a relatively young female who um, was previously healthy and presumably immunocompetent. And those two factors will be um, incredibly important as we continue to think about the differential. So she's presenting with fever of unknown origin. And what I'd add is with the weight loss and some of the other systemic symptoms, she also has B symptoms. <laughs> 
She was found to have some mesenteric lymphadenitis and numerous hepatosplenic lesions, and then subsequently developed these tender violaceous cutaneous nodules. And the fact that those came later makes you think about them being a secondary process. Really, the main notable feature of her labs was the neutrophilic leukocytosis, and that will become helpful in thinking through some of the differential later. So some other things um, when listening to the case, the benign brain lesions in the past are, are interesting and probably something that um, I would potentially explore more depending on if there was initial diagnosis um, that became clear after some workup, but I tend to think maybe with some of the additional information, they may end up being unrelated. So when we're trying to approach an unknown diagnosis, there are really kind of two ways I think about it. Either I try to come up with a problem for which I have a really good diagnostic schema that I can start with, or I think about a unique feature that has a limited differential diagnosis. So for example, an eosinophilia is something that has a pretty limited differential diagnosis and is sometimes a good thing to start your uh, differential. So for here, what I want to start with is using the diagnostic schema of fever of unknown, unknown origin to help frame this case, and then further narrow it down with something that I think is a fairly unique feature of this case, which is which are these splenic mass lesions. So let's start with fever of unknown origin. So first, I think it's important to define fever of unknown origin. Um, these are two recent articles that were written about the topic that are really helpful if you want a reference. These are things that I share with uh, learners on my team whenever we have a case like this. And the definition is having a persistent fever with no identifiable cause despite reasonable investigations. So breaking down what this means. So when we talk about fever, there are certain definitions that exist in the literature. Typically, they say a fever greater than 38.3, but I want to point out that this isn't always the case. Um, we know that previously, when normal temperature was defined, that happened in the 1800s, and body temperature has changed a little bit since then. It's actually become a little bit cooler in the general population, and that initial population the study was based on also wasn't very representative. And so I tend to look at fever curves in the chart and try to see, are there spikes that are occurring in the fever curve? And if so, I still may consider that at a fever, even if it's only reaching up to 37.9. It's important that it's persistent. And the reason this is part of the definition, usually we say about two to three weeks, is because we're trying to eliminate the possibility of this just being a systemic viral illness that will self-resolve. Um, and so, you know, presumably based on this patient's history, this has been going on for at least a couple weeks. She's had a 15 pound unintentional weight loss over that time and had been having some subjective symptoms at home. And when we say reasonable investigations, what do we mean? Well, there are some time-based criteria, but these have changed drastically over time. So it used to be three weeks of an inpatient stay was required. Um, to meet this definition, but now with the diagnostics we have with people being able to get CT scans early with blood cultures, um, easily diagnosing a lot of pathogens, this time-based criteria has changed. And so I don't rigidly stick with this time-based criteria, but I think it's helpful to just um, think about three inpatient days because that's the amount of time that you need for most blood cultures to incubate typical pathogens. And then there are a variety of test-based criteria that are recommended before you define it as a fever of unknown origin. And so here are some of those listed here. I think one important one that we talk about a lot here is an HIV test, which wasn't mentioned um, for this patient, but that would drastically change our differential diagnosis if this patient did have HIV. You can see some of the other um, initial uh, test here, but, you know, it's more a gestalt from a case and looking through and thinking about what would be reasonable tests based on their initial presentation. 
So when we're thinking about fever of unknown origin, there are really four types that we consider. Um, I'm going to come back to the classical type, which is what we're talking about here, most likely. But nosocomial FUO refers to patients who have been hospitalized and then develop a fever while in the hospital. This tends to be a lot more iatrogenic causes, maybe medications or um, medication withdrawal, drug withdrawal too. There is an FUO in immunocompromised patients. This largely tends to be infections. And what types of infections would be most prominent would depend on what type of immunodeficiency a patient has. And then there are different FUO differential diagnoses that occur based on travel history. So obviously, especially infectious pathogens vary greatly depending on where someone has been residing. And so that's an important piece to gather with the history. And with this patient, they have been based within the US and we don't have any history of additional travel. So that helps narrow down things um, substantially. So for this case, I'm gonna discuss the um, differential for classical FUO as our framework. So we generally think of four buckets with FUO. Um, first, we think about infectious etiologies, which is what my expertise is in. Um, syndromes that we tend to see are things like endocarditis, osteomyelitis, or abscesses, especially intra-abdominal abscesses like this patient has. Um, unfortunately, that's not a final diagnosis, and we have to think about what is causing those abscesses. There are different viruses that can cause an FUO. Um, EBV, CMV, and viral hepatitis, which would be a little unusual in this case based on the hepatosplenic lesions. Um, there are bacterial causes, and these tend to be more insidious bacteria that are difficult to grow in the lab. So Coxiella, Bartonella, Brucella, these are all pathogens um, that are associated with animal exposures or various foods, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Tuberculosis, Whipple's disease, and then a lot of the rickettsial and tick-borne diseases can cause an FUO as well. The endemic fungi, as many mentioned in their initial differential diagnosis, and then parasites like toxoplasma and Babesia if the patient had been to the Northeast US, which um, it does not seem she has. When we think about inflammatory etiologies, there's a number of rheumatologic diagnoses, but giant cell arteritis and polymyalgia rheumatica are two really common ones, along with lupus and stills. Sarcoidosis is always something to put on the differential um, and ends up being a diagnosis of exclusion. And then inflammatory bowel disease, particularly with um, sweet syndrome, can be seen and can cause an FUO. There are many autoinflammatory disorders um, that are disorders of the innate immune system that cause cyclical fevers, but you would not expect those to cause the hepatosplenic lesions we've seen. There are many neoplasms, and the most common are lymphoma and leukemia. The solid organ tumors that tend to cause fever are in the GU system or the GI system. And then I think about miscellaneous thinking about medications, including illicit substances and withdrawal syndromes, and the endocrinopathies, which we often forget about. For patients who have um, maybe had a trauma, things like hematomas or even clots can cause an FUO, but already based on our patient's factors, these miscellaneous syndromes seem much less likely. So, to help me really think about narrowing down this differential, I think it's really helpful to then pick out something that has a bit more of a narrower differential diagnosis and see how we can overlap these. And for this, I'm picking a splenic mass lesion. This honestly is not something that we see frequently. And so the question is, which of these could cause that? To be honest with you, this is not something I have a very good framework for. And so this is where I would honestly go to Google, okay? You know, there are times that we need to do research when we don't have a robust diagnostic schema, and this is one of them. And so I pulled up Radiopedia, which is really helpful 
to look at a lot of radiologic differential diagnoses. And this helped me think about some potential etiologies, many of which I was aware of. But again, this helps make sure that you have a broad differential and don't narrow too quickly. Because when I first heard this case, I thought about Bartonella. That's something that I've seen cause this before. But having a narrow differential early may make you miss the diagnosis. So then I went to our infectious disease textbook. You can type in search terms. And this, again, just helps me keep my differential broad. I flipped through some different pages. I read about splenic abscesses to see what are the most common etiologies and scanned the table of contents to think, are there any illnesses that I don't typically see and maybe don't think about? And then came back to the schema. And what you can see are those in orange are ones that moved higher on the differential based on my reading. Those in gray were eliminated, and those in black are things that maybe could be possible, but are very less likely. And some that really stood out to me, Bartonella is one of the most common causes of hepatosplenic lesions. Our patient didn't have a history of cat exposure, but I'll tell you that many patients do not tell you initially about their exposures until you continue to ask them four or five times. You get the pathogen, you go back, and that's when they remember something from a while ago. Brucella is something that was high on the differential, especially when I heard about the homemade cheese, because this is a pathogen that we tend to see from unpasteurized dairy products. Um, it is also something that we can see from exposure to, um, to animals, especially wild boar um, here in the central and southern U.S. And so I ask people about, you know, any exposure to animals, hunting, petting zoos, hiking. Do they work outside in a national park, landscaping and things like that? Um, TB is always up there. Um, and then histo is definitely a possibility. Um, it can cause these lesions, although when I have seen disseminated histo, it tends to be more typically um, just an enlargement of the spleen and the liver, but I have not seen abscesses like this quite as frequently. There were some new things I added from my reading listed here, and one that I wanted to point out was Burkholderia pseudomaliae, which is a pathogen that presents really similar to tuberculosis, typically in Southeast Asia, but has recently been found to be endemic in the South Central US and may be under-recognized. Um, so that is another pathogen um, that actually causes a lot of splenic lesions in, the Southeast, uh, in Southeast Asia. So then I think it's important to read about these things and think about the other factors like the skin nodules and the neutrophilia. This is where I go and talk to a lot of people. I call up my friends in Derm. I ask them to tell me more about these skin lesions. All I can say is, you know, violaceous cutaneous nodules. Tell me like other terms to use. What does the distribution tell you? And based on that was able to potentially eliminate a couple other things on here. So what I would say the next diagnostic steps would be in this case is really a dermatology consult and a biopsy. Um, I said this even before I knew who the discussants were on this case, but the important thing is to send this both for pathology um, and also for cultures, for bacterial, fungal, and AFB. And discussing the differential with our dermatology colleagues is really helpful because sometimes there are special tests we need to do. So if we suspect Bartonella, we would need to do a Warthin uh, starry stain on the biopsy. And so this is why I really think that in addition to consulting for a procedure, a diagnostic step, it's really important to have a conversation between consulting teams to say, here's what I'm thinking, here's what's on my differential, which of these things fit with the skin lesions and which don't. Um, and you know, let's kind of take it from there to think about what we need to do. And so I would also, in this case, recommend sending fungal and AFB blood cultures. Um, the fungal blood cultures would not only help with histoplasmosis, 
which um, is an intracellular organism, but also some of these other organisms that are intracellular, like brucella, that need longer incubation times. I would like to point out that when you're thinking about something like brucella or tularemia, which was also on the list, some of these things need warning to the micro lab because they're potentially hazardous to the staff. So just something to think about when you have uh, a broader differential. And then I would send off a bunch of serologies, antigens, and PCRs, because to be honest, these are going to take a while to come back. And so it's nice to get them started at this point. Um, them being negative may not help. Uh, being positive probably does. Consider an echo, but the most important thing in a case of a patient with an FUO is to daily ask them, review of systems, what's new? These skin nodules popped up newly on exam, and if you're not looking at the skin every day, you may not notice them. And then do targeted testing based on what ends up coming up on exam and history. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it back over. Thank you so much, Dr. Spicer. That was a wonderful overview of uh, fever un of unknown origin. Um, and so now I wanted to return to our poll everywhere. And I compiled the top, the top answers from our previous poll everywhere question just to kind of see a, a percentage spread in terms of what the audience is thinking right now in terms of the final diagnosis. So I'll give just a, a minute for people to put in their answers. All right, thank you everyone for the participation. So it seems like about half of the group is siding towards maybe it might be none of the above diagnoses and then another spread between some of the endemic fungi as well as Bartonella and Echinococcus. All right, thank you for the participation. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Caitlin to review some of the uh, results from the ID team and then we'll give a chance for Dr. Spicer to respond and, uh, and give her recommendations after she reviews the, the labs. Okay. Um, so just going to go back to the initial management um, for this patient. So kind of like even before the skin lesions started to develop. So really just like framing the problem as Dr. Spicer was just talking about. So this is abdominal pain in the setting of hepatic and splenic um, abscesses. So kind of biggest differential when she first came in was infectious versus malignant. Um, so kind of just like started her own broad spectrum antibiotics. She got IV flagell, ceftriaxone. Um, and then mainly just did like symptomatic treatment with like IV fluids, pain medicine, some zofran for nausea, um, and then of course like got blood cultures and then um, consulted ID um, and GI as well. Um, so just a little bit about her hospital course. She was with us for quite some time, so kind of did my best to summarize um, the big key points here. Um, but in terms of her antibiotics, she got flagell and ceftriaxone for about eight days. So the first um, days that she was here, the week, first week or so that she was here, um, was ended up starting on Zosin um, later in her hospital stay. So um, about two weeks in and was on that for a number of days. Um, interestingly, all of her blood cultures um, remain negative. So she had blood cultures on days one, two, eight, and 14, all of which were negative. Um, had both liver and splenic aspirates of the um, lesions that we saw on imaging. Um, the only thing really that we saw on those um, aspirates was PMNs um, and no organisms were ever seen. Um, no organisms grew of any of the cultures. So we had like AFB, um, fungal and bacterial and none of them, none of them ever grew. Um, we did end up sending um, a carious sequencing off um, on day 16, which is just like a blood test that tests for um, over like 1200 different organisms. And the only thing that kind of came from that interestingly was an organism called Pseudomonas luteola. Um, and the ID team at that time thought it was a contaminant um, or non-pathogenic. So really kind of um, something that we didn't worry too much about or do anything about. Um, and then again, um, those skin lesions didn't come up until about two weeks into her um, course. Um, and then dermatology was consulted and did a biopsy on day 20. 
Um, and I think the one of the most important things to kind of keep in mind about her um, like progression of disease and hospital course is that she was off and on antibiotics um, numerous times and her fevers and pain never changed. So whether she was on antibiotics or not, um, she was still having fevers and then her leukocytosis um, neutrophilic leukocytosis was also pre um, prevalent regardless of whether or not she was on antibiotics. Um, and so here, here's some of the other labs um, that we got while she was there, quite, quite a lot. I think we covered every, most everything that Dr. Spicer wanted. So um, really, honestly, essentially the summary of this is that everything that we ordered was negative. Um, so all of the infectious things were negative. Um, we did some urine and stool studies, also negative. Um, so that's, that's a big takeaway from this slide. Um, and that, yeah, so that that's really it in terms of the workup. So I'll go ahead and let Dr. Spicer um, answer a little bit um, about the results that we that we had there. Um, yeah, so I think that, you know, looking through the results, this is a really frustrating thing that happens to us in the hospital, right? We send off a bunch of tests. We're treating patients empirically and they just aren't getting better. And I think that with fever of unknown origin, that is one of the most frustrating things about it. I think what's important to remember is while you're watching a patient, um, as long as they're stable, we do initially start treatment targeted towards whatever we see. So this patient had his patosplenic le lesions totally reasonable for us to have them on antibiotics and appropriate, right? So we're targeting kind of typical pathogens that we would expect. But as the patient fails to get better, it's clear that those aren't treating the underlying pathogen. And this can be really helpful then to think about what isn't being covered by those, right? And so what isn't being covered in this case are many of the typical bacteria we discussed, like Bartonella, Brucella, Tularemia, those um, doxycycline is actually treatment of choice for many of those, sometimes in combination with other um, antibiotics. Then we're not treating fungal diseases, we're not treating mycobacterial diseases. And none of those are things that we typically want to empirically treat without other data, with the exception of maybe if we were concerned about Bartonella, at some point we may decide to trial doxycycline. Um, but initially, I think that's totally appropriate. Watch the patient, look for new clues, wait for studies to come back. The problem with a lot of these pathogens is sometimes even our serologies um, may not be helpful, especially early in the course. And so something to remember is we may have to send things again if we have a high level of suspicion. I still would say, you know, Bartonella and Brucella, Tularemia are things higher on my list. And so those are things that you may consider sending additional tests for. They can be really difficult to diagnose. Um, things like tuberculosis, even though she has a negative quantiferon, that doesn't rule out active tuberculosis. And Burkholderia pseudomeliae is something that, again, would be from specialized um, uh, cultures and testing. So um, I think that this is when you have to wait and see, and then something comes up, which in this case ended up being the skin lesions. And then thankfully, we have our dermatologist to come by and help us out. So I'll pass it over to them. Thank you so much, Dr. Spicer and Caitlin. All right, next we'll turn it over to our dermatologist specialist, uh, Dr. Osama Hashmi, current PGY4 dermatology resident here at Emory. He completed his medical school at MCG, um, as well as an MPH at University of Georgia. So thank you so much, Osama, for joining us. Thanks, John. And uh, shout out to Dr. Manning. I also did my TY here at Emory as well, so got to benefit from a lot of great teaching here. Um, my name is Osama Hashmi, currently uh, PGY4 in dermatology. and um, to be honest, this is one of our favorite consults to get as dermatologists. It's when a lot of people have put their heads together, new skin lesions pop up, and then we can come in and help try to um, add some input. Um, in terms of our perspective, we definitely get a little bit more of a privileged perspective because we entered into this case almost three weeks into the case uh, where the patient had had been on multiple antibiotics, had had multiple cultures, which were negative. Um, and so the story that we hear is a 40-year-old female, previously healthy, immunocompetent, multiple cultures, negative, multiple antibiotics, not addressing her fevers with uh, new skin lesions. 
Today, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the skin lesions that we see and a little bit of differential that we go into as dermatologists. The first uh, thing we noticed going into the room is that she has what we call these violaceous edematous nodules. So they're um, fluid filled almost, um, and in the dermatology terminology, we sometimes call these quote unquote juicy. Um, and so the lesion on the right uh, is the lesion that was on her leg that she previously thought was a folliculitis. Um, when we came in uh, several weeks later, it had turned into this uh, pretty notable um, ulcer with a hemorrhage. She had these lesions scattered throughout her, her body, especially on the extremities, so bilateral hands, um, on her abdomen. Her legs um, had some scattered edematous um, nodules, and then they were also apparent on her feet. Also um, inside her right inner upper arm, and then in the right antecubital fossa. Um, this one was interesting because it was an area that she said she had an IV stick and thought it was just an injury related to the IV stick. Um, this is important just from a dermatology perspective in the sense that uh, many inflammatory lesions cause what we call pathergy, which is if you have a ear piercing, a tattoo, or um, some sort of injury on the skin, you'll develop that inflammatory lesion onto that area of injury. Um, for people still remembering things from step one, it's classic in psoriasis called kebnerization, where if you get a scratch, you might get an area of psoriasis there. And so that's an important um, clue. And then over the next couple of days, watching her, um, this is kind of the progression of one of the lesions on the hand um, that we're watching over time became more edematous um, over time. Important for this is also some pertinent negatives from her physical exam. So she didn't have any oral lesions, didn't have any eye or other mucosal involvement. Um, on exam, she, didn't, she also didn't have any lymphadenopathy. So it was really these discrete, juicy, um, violaceous nodules um, throughout her extremities. Differential-wise, so very similar to Dr. Spicer's differential, we always start off fairly broad, thinking about non-infectious ideologies, infectious ideologies, neoplastic, and then others such as genodermatoses. She also had a negative family history for any skin diseases um, as well. So now I'll go into a little bit of differentials that we think about. One is obviously fungal. Um, the fungal that I picked for this one was just aspergillosis, but you have a wide range of different um, fungal um, diseases that can potentially cause skin nodules. Generally invasive aspergillosis, um, you think about people who are immunosuppressed, um, people like transplant patients, um, but they can provide a variety of different um, skin findings, including um, cellulitis, solitary plaques, sub subcutaneous nodules, papules, and even uh, pustules. Another thing in our differential from the infectious standpoint is Bartonella, and we didn't uh, collaborate on this, so yeah, it's just um, two people kind of thinking the same here, which is you get these um, erythematous violaceous nodules. Generally, you also have um, some lymphadenopathy, at least distal to the site, um, and then if you're lucky, you might get some history in terms of uh, recent trauma, or like a cat scratch or, or a rodent bite. Another one that's also important to consider um, from the inflammatory uh, area is something called erythema nodosum. So this is a paniculitis. It's inflammation that's happening in the sub-Q fat. Um, this oftentimes is secondary to something else going on. 50% um, of the time it's idiopathic, but 50% of the time it'll be related to either an infection, um, sarcoidosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and sometimes even medications like um, OCPs. This patient was not taking any uh, OCPs at, at the time. And then on the differential, I have two more just to go over pretty quickly. Just from a neoplastic perspective, um, something that comes up is leukemia cutis, um, which is cutaneous manifestation of internal leukemia. Um, generally, this portends for a worse prognosis of a, of a patient's leukemia um, and warrants a further workup with hematology. Um, additionally, you might see features um, like thrombocytopenia, which on the skin would be more like bruising or, or petechiae on the skin. And the final one to think about, um, especially with her um, ulcerations that developed is something called pyoderma gangrenosum. It's an inflammatory condition. Um, once again, has a lot of uh, associations secondary to inflammatory bowel disease, medications, infections. Um, it's pretty classic in terms of its appearance where you get these uh, very kind of clean undermined, undermined edges. And then sometimes we'll get some um, kind of purulence over top, which is more just uh, neutrophilic. So with that, Kind of keeping the differential broad, we had a pretty high pretest probability of thinking about what this could be, given the fact that we had so many cultures that, that were negative. Um, in dermatology, we like to use biopsies to kind of support our conclusions based on history, physical exam, and all the other tests that have been done. Um, and so we did a biopsy. We did two biopsies. One was sent um, for H&E, which is literally to just look at the tissue and see if there's any certain patterns that there that might uh, help us determine 
what might be going on in the skin. And a second biopsy we do, uh, we send out for culture. So we sent a biopsy for fungal bacterial culture, just in case there was something on the skin that wasn't getting caught um, with the other cultures. And with that, I'll pass it back to John. Awesome. Thank you so much, Osama. All right. And to wrap it up, we have our dermatopathology colleagues. Uh, this is Dr. Zach Wilner, who's a current PGY-5 dermatopathology fellow here at Emory. He completed medical school at SUNY Downstate, after which he completed his dermatology residency here with us at Emory back in 2022. So thank you so much, Zach, for taking over. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me and having me to discuss this uh, interesting case. And thank you for the excellent discussion, Dr. Hashmi and Dr. Spicer, um, Dr. Blanchard. Um, so even as someone who's interested in pathology, it was still a little foreign to me what actually happens after you do a biopsy and it's something I've been learning a lot about. And it's kind of uh, something I kind of want to impart upon you um, through this discussion. So when we're often doing a biopsy for something that we're considering infectious, it's uh, often about the size of a pencil eraser. So this one here is an excision, so it's a little bigger, um, but um, what we do then is often have to fix it informally, go to the lab, someone looks at it, uh, kind of makes some notes about what it looks like, and then they have to try to make it fit into about something about the size of a matchbox. So if it doesn't fit, we often make little cuts in it. So for this one, for example, they did four cuts, so there'd be four different matchbox size pieces that they then put into a form or a paraffin or wax embedded uh, a block is what we call them. Um, this is then uh, gets very thinly sliced and put on a glass side and stained. So for a four millimeter punch biopsy, we actually only look at about one to maybe even 2% of the actual specimen. So very, very little. Um, so with that in mind, um, this is what we get. Um, this is from our patient and you can kind of see the epidermis or the top layer of the skin here the stratum corneum, you know, the deep dermis going down into the subcutis. Um, and you can see there's this dense infiltrate um, present in the superficial reticular and deep dermis, even going down a little bit into the subcutis. So on a little higher power, we can see there's some spaces between the keratinocytes, so there's some edema, and then this dense neutrophilic infiltrate here. And even on higher power, we can kind of just see more of those neutrophils. There are some lymphocytes and some histiocytes here as well. Um, we can do other stains other than H and E here. We can do uh, a stain for a fungus. We can do a stain for acid fast bacilli. But given how little of the specimen we're looking at, it's often very, very low sensitivity. So it's very rarely that we do find something that's actually pathogenic. So in that in mind, we often highly recommend that if you're considering infectious, you also do a tissue culture as Dr. Blanchard recommended and kind of bring all these pieces together, whether it be ancillary tests such as um, uh, kind of ELISAs or PCRs for the, the pathogens, because we very often can we actually confirm a diagnosis of infectious. We'll often see a pattern on here, a very dense neutrophilic infiltrate until proven otherwise would be suggestive of infectious. Now, if you do additional workup that shows there's no infectious organisms in this case, then we could say this is also consistent with a neutrophilic dermatosis, such as pyoderma gangrenosum or sweet syndrome. So with pathology, I wouldn't say this is at all biopsy proven, but this is supportive of a neutrophilic dermatosis in the case that all other infectious etiologies are, are kind of ruled out. That's just something I want to emphasize that, especially with inflammatory things, um, we really often ever prove anything. We more kind of support a certain specific pattern um, that requires the clinical input that you guys did a great job collecting, um, ancillary tests such as labs or imaging to kind of bring everything together. Perfect. Thank you so much, Zach. All right. And to wrap up the CPC, we have some concluding remarks um, from Caitlin Blanchard giving us an update on the patient as well as a little bit of the teaching points. Thank you, Caitlin. Awesome. Thank you, John. So thank you um, for all of our discussions as well. Um, so given um, kind of what um, we've discussed, we kind of proceeded forward with this being um, a diagnosis um, supported by dermapathology of acute febrile neutrophilic dermatosis. Um, so to conclude, I'm just going to kind of discuss a little bit about this syndrome, what it is, how we treat it, and things like that. And then I'll give some updates about um, our patient at the end. So this syndrome is characterized by an abrupt appearance of painful um, 
an erythematous and edematous papules, plaques, or nodules on the skin, um, often accompanied by fever and leukocytosis, um, typically occurs in people aged 30 to 60, um, seems to have a slight female predominance, um, and then the eyes, musculoskeletal system, and internal organs can also be involved. Um, so different classifications of sweet syndrome, um, there's three that kind of are the main ones. So classical or idiopathic, malignancy associated, um, and drug induced. Um, so classical is definitely the most common, frequently associated with um, infections, URI um, or GI infections, IBD. I know Dr. Spicer alluded to this a little bit earlier in her presentation, as well as pregnancy. Um, malignancy associated sweet syndrome um, tends to happen in um, the older patient population who kind of like get sweet syndrome. It seems like hematologic malignancies um, are more common than solid tumor malignancies with AML being the most frequently associated malignancy. Um, and then among the solid tumors, carcinomas of the GU, GI um, tract, as well as breast carcinoma are the most common. Um, and then in terms of drug-induced sweet syndrome, typically develops about two weeks after exposure to whatever the medication is, um, and it's definitely likely to recur with re-exposure to the medication. Um, so on the next slide here, I just have a list of all of the different um, medications that have been found to um, cause sweet syndrome. Just kind of wanted to put it here just to kind of get a good picture for how, how wide it is. Um, some of these medications are not stuff that we use every day, but some definitely are, um, like brosamide, for example. So just, just something to keep in mind that... Um, Medications that we give patients, while uh, of course being super helpful, can also kind of cause other problems and things like that. Um, so how do we treat um, sweet syndrome? Steroids is definitely the go-to, um, which she, the, our lady ended up getting um, oral steroids. She started at um, 80 and then was tapered down. Um, depending on how much of like the body is covered with the lesions, you can also try like topical or intralesional um, steroids, like high potency high potency um, if less than 5% of the surface body area is um, involved. Some alternatives if patients can't um, receive systemic steroids for any reason are sometimes these medications are even used kind of like as dual therapy um, are dapsone, colchicine, and potassium iodide. Um, and then in terms of how long we treat patients, it, it definitely varies based on patient to patient. Um, we can actually see a pretty quick response um, once the steroids are started. Patients often will improve symptomatically within 48 hours of initiating therapy. Um, and then once the disease is controlled, meaning once kind of we start getting new lesions, then we can kind of start talking about tapering the steroids over the next four to six weeks. Um, unfortunately, sometimes the disease can recur when the steroids are tapered. Um, and if this does happen, the current recommendations are to continue prednisone at the lowest possible dose um, that we can achieve like control of the disease for another two to three months. So um, given the known association with malignancy, our patient actually stayed with us in the hospital for another week or so just to get some more tests and things like that done. So she received a bone marrow biopsy as well as an upper and lower endoscopy. Um, her bone marrow biopsy came back as abnormal, um, kind of appearing reactive. Luckily, there were no markers for dysplasia or myeloma or anything like that. Um, she did have a gastric fundus mass that was found on um, biopsy. Um, there was no significant histopathologic um, alteration from the biopsy, um, and then no H. pylori or anything like that as well. Um, and then she also had an endoscopic ultrasound biopsy that was done of the same um, gastric fundus mass. Um, and they found, they did a biopsy and found pus and inflammatory debris. And interestingly, um, her cultures from that grew in Terabacter. Um, so just to kind of wrap up our patient, um, some of the conclusion, unfortunately, is limited. She ended up moving back to Texas um, within days of being discharged from the hospital. Um, but some updates. Thankfully, she has been improving since getting the steroids. She hasn't had any more fevers, no abdominal pain. Um, her malaise and fatigue is getting better as well. Um, she finished her steroid taper on October 22nd, so she was admitted September 1st, kind of had that whole stay, and so was on steroids for a number of weeks. Um, skin lesions are doing a lot better, um, kind of healing really well, she says.
Um, although she did develop a new lesion on the bottom of her foot a few days after stopping the steroids. Thankfully, she has close follow-up back in Houston. So um, whether or not she goes back on steroids, I'm not sure, but she does have a new lesion that um, seemed to develop after stopping the steroids. Um, and then finally, she actually got 21 days of levofloxacin for that enterobacter infection that was found on her gastric um, antrum. So she um, is currently receiving treatment for that as well. Um, and so, yeah, these are the take home points, um, kind of just like our learning objectives that we talked about at the beginning. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight a few things that I think I learned from this case. Um, and I know Dr. Spicer also alluded to this as well, um, as well as our other discussants, but definitely important to like do a thorough physical exam every single day. I know we talk about this a lot, but especially in her case, um, I mean, these skin lesions didn't pop up until two weeks into her hospital stay. And so I think it can be easy to kind of get into a routine and, you know, our patients for the most part can stay pretty stable. And so I think just like emphasizing to do a, a good physical exam every single day, I think is really important. Um, and then finally to not get like kind of, you know, anchored into one diagnosis and like when things aren't adding up, I think it's super important to just take a step back and really reevaluate the patient, talk to all of our wonderful consultants that we have around us and put all of our heads together so that we can help treat our patients. Um, and yeah, that that's really, that's all I have. Um, but thank you so much, everyone. It's been, this was great. Perfect. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you to all of our discussants and our case presenter. Um, this was an awesome case to kind of review and put together with the team. Um, and I put a QR code here for just a little bit of evaluation to help improve our, our process for chief residents. We're really intentional about improving these, uh, these conferences. So Thank you all for participating. Um, and thank you again. Big shout out to all of our discussants. Actually, there's a question in the chat, I think. Yes. Uh, the way I think we have time for Dr. Steinberg had a question. Next time, we're going to unmute and ask. Yeah, yeah I was curious, but Jennifer, Jennifer thought of that ISIL to the inner back. Do you think it's a pathogen that would you have treated with 21 days of levofloxacin? Um, I probably wouldn't have, you know, we're doing a biopsy that's in the gastrointestinal tract, and that's a pathogen that we expect to see in the GI tract. And so I think that it's not necessarily um, something that needs to be treated if we have an alternate diagnosis for what's going on. Um, I can understand that sometimes people are nervous when someone's on steroids about the potential of having something untreated. Um, but antibiotics aren't without risks, especially for a prolonged period of time. And so I think that it would have been completely reasonable um, to presume that that was um, a uh, expected finding there and not to treat it. But I think these are the hard things in medicine that there's no perfect answer for. Great, thank you. Lots of kudos in the chat. This is a fantastic, you guys put this together beautifully and developed the case beautifully and wonderful discussion by all of our contributors. Thanks so much. Thank you.